Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, welcome Stephanie Porter back. She's going to be our next uh, presenter. So a brief introduction. Uh, Stephanie is an expert in her field with over 20 years of uh, experience in agronomy and plant pathology. She holds master's degrees from the University of Illinois. She's a certified crop advisor and was named the 2018 Illinois Certified Crop Advisor Master Soybean Advisor. Uh, so I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to Stephanie uh, for her presentation, From Field to Future, Lessons from the 2023 Growing Season. Thank you so much, Stacy. Uh, if everybody wants to stand up and stretch, this is your time. How about that? I'm afraid I'm ready to fall asleep. I love all right, for those of you that are online and are worried about CEUs, do not fret. Everything is going to be okay. We're going to give out some information for you to get your CEUs and also for the recording. Um, if you want to get CEUs, we have instructions on how you can self-report on elsoyadvisor.com. You can go to our events page on elsoyadvisor.com, click on Soybean Summit, or click on Better Beans. And I have instructions there on how you can self-report your CEUs as well. It's pretty easy, I've done it. All right, I'm gonna get started. Maybe we are taking a break now. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to cover a lot today, uh, a lot of different things, and so I don't want you to get overwhelmed. I'm going to concentrate on Central Illinois, um, but we are running around um, in the entire state. I'm fortunately located in South Central Illinois, so I can run down south. Um, sometimes I run north when I'm here. I consider this northern Central Illinois. Um, so up next, if anything I talk about today, we will have some kind of information, some kind of content, some kind of outreach on elsoyadvisor.com. And you can get there. Um, our main source of information and content would be the Field Notes blog. All of that goes out through a newsletter or social media on Twitter, as well as Facebook, thanks to Miss Kelsey. Kelsey Litchfield, so big shout out, Kelsey, thank you. Um, if you will want to sign up for our newsletter, you can go to the Elsway Advisor website on your phone or your computer. You scroll all the way down and you can put in your information and you can get a newsletter from us um, that way. But if you prefer social media, a lot of the same content's going out that way as well. I also want to give a shout out today to our uh, soy envoys. So if you're a soy envoy, if you want to stand up, um, please do. We've got Miss Karen Corrigan here in the house, as well as Chris Ehler. Uh, they are wonderful resources, and I just want to give them a big thank you for helping out to, to some of this content um, is there on El Soy Advisor, um, and thank you for your time this year. And you might even see their names in my presentation um, as we go through it. Also, I want to give a shout out to the Soy Envoys for participating in a new endeavor, um, which is an online crop report. This currently is also on our El Soy Advisor website. And this is the agronomy team, as well as Soy Envoys and others, even board members every once in a while reporting what they're seeing, what pests they're seeing, what growth stages they're seeing, what issues they're seeing, weather, um, and so on. And so this was our first year with that um, project. And then my favorite part, if you don't know where anything is and you just want to search for it on our website, we have a new online library. We haven't really promoted it much yet. But if you want to say, for example, uh, the hot thing seems to be red crown wrong. So put red crown rod in there, and all the information that we have on red crown rod pops up on elsewayadvisor.com. So this is how we're going to start out. Thanks, Chris. This is, this is all you, right? So 
the season started out where we have a lot of people in Central Illinois planning early and we had some people have some issues uh, with some frost early on um, and so on and, and by May 23rd we were starting to see some drought creep in a little bit um, in Western Illinois as well and then uh, Dr. Connor Sybil it was very cool and wet and he had reported for example those that had put on some PK early that they were seeing some good responses to that just because of the cool conditions. One of my first field visits was in the Pekin area um, and when I went there the, the big red flag for me was holy crap they're already running in irrigation and that's not normal if you run and look at fields uh, as an agronomist in Illinois. And that's when it kind of uh, resonated with me that we could have issues coming in. Another thing that happened in May 26 is we had really, really low humidity. And that's not normal either, right? And so as we head on um, into the season here, uh, we had a, a plant start growing. They started to take up more moisture. And so as Trent Ford said here, um, we were really starting to get in trouble and we were setting ourselves up because of the lack of rain as, and as well as those plants taking up all that moisture um, for a flash drought. Um, we were getting very, very little, if we did get precipitation, very, very little amounts. Um, and we were lucky enough on our farm to be in that green spot there that had gotten a little bit of moisture, but we were very abnormal as usual um, compared to the rest of the state. Uh oh. Um, so at this time, we have a board member um, that had, you know, we're like, how's everything going? We're checking on the crops. You know, in Central Illinois, we have good black dirt, good water holding capacity. At this time, crops were doing pretty good. Um, and so we were okay. Um, at this time, uh, Chris Ehlers, soybeans were blooming, right? Uh, our early planted beans on May 31st. But we had lots of questions uh, from farmers coming in saying, oh my gosh, we have no moisture in the ground. Um, should we be spraying residuals? And some of the extension people I know were tweeting out, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain, right? Don't worry. It's going to rain. And then it just not rain. It did not rain. And then Karen wrote a nice article. It was very dry. And then it was becoming hot. And we need to do our post residual, sorry, post herbicides. And how do we handle that situation? And then, of course, those pesky Japanese beetles started to be seen around June 30th, 13th, reported by. Uh, our director, Abigail Peterson. And so as we entered in here, um, you can see we were in pretty good um, trouble here. We had major uh, dryness. We were about to break records um, across the portion of the Corn Belt, as you can see there. Uh, we did get some rain around this period of time between June 6th and 12th. <laughs> but it was mostly the south of the state, not in this area, across central Illinois, I should say. And so on June 14th, between April 1st and June 10th, it was now the second driest on record um, compared to 19, next to 1988. Uh, we were starting to see some rootworm injury in the Champaign area, which didn't help matters. If you don't have roots, you can't take up water. And that's not good. Um, and then on June 18th, we did get slight rain, but it was only in Western Illinois and Southern Illinois. And then on June 19th, or around so, that area, uh, Chris Ehler and Dr. Hager started to report issues with herbicide carrier over. It had been dry the previous year, dry this year. They were seeing carryover symptoms of certain herbicides in soybeans. And then towards the end of June, one of the major questions was why are all my soybeans yellow? And so we did a lot of talking about on field days about 
Potassium, drought induced potassium deficiency. Lots of questions on that. Why are my soybeans yellow? So it wasn't that necessarily the lack of potassium in your field, it was just we didn't have moisture to uptake the potassium. However, we did have some other things going on, and I'll get into that in my presentation, um, that can also cause the same symptoms. Um, but for now, that's pretty much what was going on for the most part. We had worries about spider mites. I know we started blogging about spider mites. They did have major issues with spider mites in Western Illinois and Southern Illinois. And who can forget the haze, right? So June 28th, I know it happened throughout the season, but that was a major issue as well. And we did have some beetle feeding in some areas uh, that, that happened. And then lastly, and I know this is what an issue in our own farm, my brother actually was texting me and he's like, I just don't know, I don't, we don't, it's so dry, our corn looks bad, I don't know if I should spray, there's no, nothing out there. And so then, on June 29th, the bean mobile was at our first field day and there was a thing called the derecho over there. Everybody, Connie, I don't know how you forgot, but I will never forget, we were in a shed and this, we were able to carry out our field day. It was a very nice day. And that little red dot where you point to, where that the, the wind gust got up to 65 miles per hour, we were all in the shed. So we bonded that day, team meeting, right? And then after that, we got copious amounts of rain. And I want you to kind of look this map, when I start showing pictures of diseases, it really will match up to some of those areas where you see 2.58, 2.8, 2 inches, 3.3, 3.1 inches. Some areas of Central Illinois got some significant amount of rain. And then Northern Illinois actually got a lot more even after that. So we started to see some fungicide helicopters for that early, early planted corn. We were one of those people that planted corn the first week of April on our own farm. Um, and then there was a lot of questions, including my own brother, like why the heck is the, the corn so short this year? And you know, it's, it's okay, it's dry, it's gonna be okay. Gotta help them through it, right? It's gonna, it can yield, but um, we had people tweeting about how, you know, Rows should be closed by this time of soybeans. And it, it wasn't happening by July 4th. It just wasn't happening. And our post herbicides were being sprayed. And then something happened where we got all this rain and all these plants started to grow really, really, really fast. And I had done a field visit and you're gonna see a picture of really, really sad looking corn coming up. But that corn grew right out of it when it got that rain. We're right out of those oopsies, what I call them. And so we had issues where we didn't know if we usually need to apply fungicides, insecticides at R3. And soybeans were at R3, but when we got that amount of rain, they grew more and went back into R1. So there was a lot of questions. You know, we didn't have the little pods on top. They were blooming on top of it. So should we spray or should we not spray? Just weird things going on. And then by July 11th, half of Illinois was in drought, despite the rain. Even though we would gotten copious amount of rains in areas, we were still in a drought. It just wasn't enough at that time. So I got a call from, actually, I was referred to this person, um, and I went to his field in Fithian. And he was a, a good farmer. And he said, you know, this is an arm. No, this is a, an issue. He's like, everybody's soybeans are turning yellow. And it's just not just me. And we rode around and looked at a lot of fields. And uh, a lot of people would say that this was uh, um, autism, potassium, or deficiency, or whatever drought induced. Um, but this was something more. And so we did look into it. And I'll go in further into that in, in the presentation. And then another field visit that I got called on on July 11th was in Waterman. 
And this was a fun field call because it was completely just pouring when I went into the field. And this was my chance, my only chance. I didn't want to have to drive that far again. And so I went out into the field and I looked, but I was unable to take soil samples at that time. The farmer came out, great farmer. He said, I looked in the book. I think this is Fusarium, what they call Fusarium home. And I said, I think you're right. And so I said, but I really want you to send it off to the lab and tell me, uh, you know, and, and let's rule, make sure it's not. Um, so the thing with Fusarium Wilt, and at this time, a lot of people were sending off plants to a plant clinic, not necessarily U of I, Purdue, Iowa, Missouri, and some agronomists were sending off to multiple labs. And so they were calling me up and they're like, Stephanie, I'm sending this off. Um, people are calling this Phytophthora. Uh, I'm getting results back saying it's Fusarium. And in some cases it was Pythium, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia. So what happens, uh, soybeans get stressed and you're gonna have, and they're sitting in water, you're gonna get a lot of pathogens attacking them. And then what happens is people stop there. And so in my past, Fusarium is not a primary pathogen in Illinois at this time. I'm not gonna say it never will be, but in my mind, this is a red flag there's something else going on in that field. Yes. Was this a low-lying area in the field? I can verify that because uh, I was standing in water. That was that hot in my boots. So yeah, this is a low-lying area. And guess what? This and this also came back fusarium and it grew out of it. This made 70 bushels to the acre. This grew out of it and it was fine. I was never able to go back to soil sample that. I did this one, and I'll tell you about it later. Leave me in suspense. So at this time, what the heck was going on? So on July 12th, basically, I call this day root rot mania, right? Everybody and their dog, every agronomist, every farmer, everybody was tweeting about it. They were finding root rot everywhere. And so one of the main things I think that happened first and some of the pictures that you just saw was Karen Corgan shared this tweet with me. And I think it's, it, 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 it's not exactly what happened, but it's similar. So basically we had a lot of rain. There's a, la a lack of oxygen to the roots. And basically plants weren't getting nitrogen. They were yellow in some cases. They were stressed. They were sitting in water and they were getting some pathogens. But then we also started to get reports of Phytophthora all over the Midwest, not just Central Illinois. I'm gonna really mess that up. The other thing that I don't want anybody to forget to do, because we do this so often when I go to field visits, is everybody wants to look above ground. When you first go to the field, you have to look below. And it's not just for pathogens, it's not just for sweeping system and toad. It's for actually seeing if there's any kind of compaction. So this is a picture that I received from Chris Casey, but it's much, much later in the season and there's probably other things going on. But one of the things you need to do is make sure they didn't mud it in and you're not seeing signs of compaction. And yes, this is much more common seen in the south or where they have less darker soils um, but one thing that can cause lack of nutrients to the plant is when you don't have a good root system and the other thing that we learned this year is that we saw a lot more potassium symptoms uh, deficient systems symptoms earlier in the season because that's when one fourth of the uptake so basically the plant was starving for it at the time and then at this time, at, or when we got hit potting, we started to see some yellowing because that's when uh, most of the nitrogen uptake occurs during potting, as well as the phosphorus uptake. But that's a whole nother presentation, so we'll move on. So this time, um, on our own farm, we were seeing some pollination. It was time for insecticide on July 14th, insecticide. Still some spider mites popping up in some areas. On our own farm, I mean, we still didn't see any major disease on soybeans. We were seeing some septoria brown spot. Of course, we always have that on our farm. 
And then the double crops, man, they were loving that rain, right? And that's a little bit abnormal for us. So we were excited about that double crop. Um, but basically, July 20th hit, and we were seeing major rot, root rots, as I said before, root rot mania. The other thing that popped up was red crown rot. And so, the, do you know the disease triangle, right? So, the disease triangle, we had perfect conditions. We had a susceptible host, we had the pathogen there, and we'll talk more about Phytophthora in a minute, but basically we were seeing perfect conditions for a whole bunch of root rots. We were starting to see grain fill on July 27th on our early planted corn in central Illinois, but by this time it's just hotter than heck out there in the field. But still seeing a lot of drought. Um, I know that the phytophthora showed up a lot earlier than this, but this is one of the field visits that I went on. Um, this is soybean variety that I'm very familiar with. I was a previous soybean product manager. We sold a lot of this soybean, uh, three, 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 in Ohio. If you're not familiar with Ohio, it's the mecca of Pythium and Phytophthora. And this soybean did well there. And so they called me out, um, previous coworkers. I went out in the field. Kelsey got to go with me. It was so fun. She loved it. Um, and this field, at first, you're like, oh, it's, it's not a big deal. And then we start going in, and we're like, oh, crap. And I'm like, this is Phytophthora. Of course, they sent it out, off, that's fine. Get a second opinion. It was Phytophthora. And so this is not some a normal occurrence. This Phytophthora, you have two phases. You have an early phase of Phytophthora, and we have seed treatments to help with that, right? We like seed treatments. But then seed treatments wear off. They don't last forever. And then Phytophthora has another second phase where it kills adult plants. And, and certain varieties can have good natural tolerance to Phytophthora, which is what I recommend you try to get now. And you also have lots of different levels of resistance genes that can go under this. And so what's happening, and it's very possible that we do have some Phytophthora's now that could be overcoming these genes. And so I'll leave it at that. And I've invited Dr. Mike Martin Chilvers to come and talk more about that, as well as why it won't at our Northern Illinois Better Beans. So if you want to tune in to that, uh, to hear more there. And then on August 7th, Chris Healer started to report that we were seeing sudden death syndrome, as well as he tweeted a picture of swimming system toad like I had never seen before. Like we see that stuff in the South all the time, right? But he was tweeting this stuff in Central Illinois. So uh, the drought, of course, can make swimming system toes worse. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about white mold, but it was not something that we thought we would see in a dry year in Northern Illinois. It did happen. I know when I did a field visit, I asked the farmer, have you sprayed yet for white mold? And he said, I didn't get to. So it was raining, maybe possibly around the time where they could have sprayed and they weren't spraying, but I'm not sure what all happened. We had heard some conditions for white mold. We had some gosses will show up on our farm and corn. But at this time, double crop soybeans still look good and they're flowering. Very exciting. And then it's getting late. It's August. So, my slide's showing up weird here. So at this time, on July 19th, I was, around this time I was at uh, Ore Field Day, at U of I Field Day, and I was wanting to learn more about a disease called red crown rot. And Dr. Carl Bradley from Kentucky was there, and at the same time I'd met a gentleman from Nutrien who was extremely interested in red crown rot as well. And we happened to sit next to it, each other, and at that time, we both at the same time started to get texts that people were starting to find red crown rot in Illinois. Um, he was 
<laughs> covered Missouri and Western Illinois. They haven't technically that I know of found right Crown Mountain, Missouri. They think it's probably there, right? And then Abigail, I tell Abigail, my our director, texting her, and she sends me this picture right here. And I was like, Abigail, do you know what that is? Or that could be, I mean, I don't know for sure. I was like, that's really red. And she's like, well, I just found it in one of our plots, which is in Wawigwa, very close to where I live. So where, where do you think I went that night? So um, I, this is Austin Winker's farm. I ran down there, it's very close to my house. Um, and we went to the field and I actually went to um, this field next where there's stew there. Um, and Austin goes, you're in the wrong field, Stephanie. I'm like, I know, but do you see this? He goes, this is my neighbor's field. So this field was planted earlier and it was much more progressed. And I said, I've never seen my crown rock before. I'm sorry, I was nerding out and Austin had to chill out, sorry, Austin. But, um, but then we started to look at his fields and he said, we couldn't find it. So I called Abigail at this time, we couldn't see it from the field. You couldn't see it from the car. Abigail had scouted these fields. We had to do this. And at the beginning of the field, that's how we found it. And then Austin said, I want to look at every one of my soybean fields. So that evening we drove to seven fields of his and we found red crown rot in the entryway of all but one field on his farm. And so um, basically, um, I had taken Stu back, I did Stu is in the house, and I wanted to have him, you know, you try to do your best, right? You want to give him good symptoms, you want to get a good picture. And he's looking at these roots and he's like, Stephanie, they're not red. I'm like, I totally disappointed Stu, I'm sorry. But they didn't look like the typical symptoms. I think with the drought and the stress, these roots were deteriorating quickly and fast. And we'll talk about the little red par parathesia, the fruiting bodies that were on there. We couldn't find those hardly at all this year. And that's like one of the key diagnostic symptoms um, that we, we found. So what is red crown rot? So quick history lesson. Um, it was first detected on peanuts in 1966 in Georgia, causing disease known as black root rot. Later in 1972, this pathogen was found um, to cause issues in soybeans, and they called it red crown rot. And it had other names as well. One that I've heard is black root rot. And then in 2017, technically 2018, Dr. Nathan Klecheski reported this disease for the first time in Illinois in Pike County. And then, since then, in all the round red counties, you can see 2019 to 2021, it was being found throughout the state. We just, we had been reading a little bit about it. It just wasn't on our, maybe perhaps our own farm at that time, and we weren't as concerned. Um, and now at this time, it's also being found in Kentucky, as well as now found in Indiana as well. So, uh, go back to that slide. Yes. So Clay County must have some kind of infecting device. I don't know, or maybe we we'll look at it. Maybe we just haven't found it yet. Maybe next year. I don't know. Um, so I had met up with Robert Bellum earlier in the year. He's former U of I Extension. And it's funny how you you meet I'm meeting up with all my previous co-workers now, so that's fun. And he had been dealing with this disease now on in his retirement as he's been working on brace farms in Madison County. And I said, tell me everything you know. I wanna know everything. So he did. And so a little bit about this disease is it infects early. And I like to compare it to sun death syndrome because that's one of the first diseases I ever knew on our farm as a little girl, right? So SDS, it's very similar. When SDS infects, it likes cool temperatures. This is the opposite, it likes warmer temperatures. So that's one of the main differences. But other than that, it's very similar. And then when you get bloom to pod, um, the fungus, you have to have rain, you have to have water. What did we have the first of July? Big rain. 
Then that fungus that's in the base of the plant, or like in STS, it sends up a toxin and it makes these symptoms that we'll see in a minute show up on the plant. And then later on, it will produce these red kind of parathesia fruiting structures. And those are actually the survival structures that fall back into the ground. And so it's there, it's there for a long time. They said like seven years, I think it's just probably, it's, it's there, right? Like soybeans and snow toad. So the other problem is, is that not only does red crown rot cause this intervenal necrosis, but so does sudden death syndrome, so does brown stem rot, and so does stem canker, okay? So at this time, and as you got later into the season, the main issue was that everybody was cause, calling this red crown rot. And there was a lot of agronomists and a lot of people getting very upset because there was people misdiagnosing this. And so at that time, we learned that we really needed to do more work and a review. I did a presentation not too long ago at North and they're like, wow, you're bringing up a lot of stuff that I haven't seen in a while. Um, but we saw it this year out in the field. The other thing that ha happened later in the season, I was reminded by Chris Ehler, is that you can also have soybean varieties sensitive to triazole phytoxicity. And that can also look the same. It can also have that intervenal necrosis in hot, dry conditions. This was later in the season. Just want to note that, August 4th. And so when we see diseases, so here's the lesson, right? So if you don't see any kind of uh, uh, issues on the, no external symptoms on the stem, you split the stem, right? And if it's brown, it's brown stem rot. And normally we would say, if it's not brown, it's STS. But now it could be STS or red brown rot, right? And then the other thing that I kind of think that got maybe misdiagnosed is we have a little pest called the stem borer. I want to note that it comes in late August, early September. But if you cut the stem on the stem borer, it's brown. And later in the season, that little pest, that little larva, it may not be there. And so people may call that brown stem rot as well. And then next up, I had people in Northern Illinois that were having sun death syndrome issues and people kept wanting to call it red crown rot. So it was a major issue. Sometimes soy SDS, if there's moisture, you can see this blue kind of cool fungal. Uh, not always, we saw it this year because of the moisture. It's not a key diagnostic symptom because it's not always there. But the other thing to remember is at the end of the season with SDS, it will drop leaves. All the other diseases will hold on to their leaves. And so that's another difference. But what it comes down to is sometimes we just don't know for sure. And so we were encouraging people to submit samples to the U of I plant clinic. And at that time, Dr. Uh, Clow, Stephen Clow at USDA ARS, was doing research on red crown rot. He reached out to me, he said, somebody said, I needed to call you. And he said, I will pay for their fee. So we tried to put that word out. You can send off a sample, print off a form, it's gonna be free um, to send it into the plant clinic. And so by this time, later in the season, I was writing articles that said, sudden death syndrome still exists because people kept calling everything red crown rot and it wasn't. We did still have those other diseases out there. And in this specific case, I was provided by Chris Casey awesome amount of information. He was that second person where that farmer had called and said, this guy kept saying I'm red crown rot and I think it's SDS. What do you think? And he provided me all this information. It was two different varieties. You can see differences in varieties. One had SDS seed treatment, one did not. That'll make a difference as well. And so he had actually did send it off to the plant clinic and it was indeed sentinel syndrome. Now, if you see a plant out there that does have blotches on the stem, then it could be Phytophthora, stem canker, or white mold. So stem canker, I'm finding a lot of that as an agronomist in the last 10 years. Um, and so I think this is a, a disease that's often misdiagnosed. It shows up later in the season, 
and it basically causes these major cankers on the stem and it again can cause symptoms i think it could very much so look a lot like right crown knot and the above ground symptoms look just like right crown knot and so one of the best pictures of stem canker i saw and i grabbed was and you don't always see this but stem canker is best diagnosed when the plant's green and unfortunately as an agronomist i've been called out when it's turned and it's harder to diagnose it but when it's green you can see that that cankering that black on the stem and it can also be confused with phytophthora the other thing with this disease is i want to point out that there's a lot of different things that you can do to help with this disease and this is a good example and so one of the things is that you can have a disease history of this disease um, it can come in on seed, like a lot of diseases can. It can be worse with a higher population, kind of like white mold, for example. It also can have alternate hosts and weeds. Um, I had another freak disease I didn't want to talk about that was happened this year, and it showed up on all the fields that the farmer had mowed and it was a perfect pattern. It had came in from, from the, the ditches. Um, fungicide with this disease. Maybe it might help fungicide if you do it early, but most of the time we're doing it R3, and so it probably doesn't gonna help. Uh, another example with this disease, it likes high fertility. Um, I've seen it in fields with no-till as well. I talked to one of our board members that had it in a no-till field and not other fields, is no-till fields only. Um, another disease that likes high fertility that I can attest to is white mold as well. So when you look at two different varieties, you can see that who's ever heard of scores? A score of a disease. Does anybody raise your hand if you look at disease scores? Anybody in this room? So disease scores do matter. Uh, as a former product manager, we do take and do a lot of testing on diseases. I won't go into it, but they give them scores. In this instance, there's two varieties here. One is good and nine is the worst. So we have scores for Phytophthora, brown stem rot, soybean white mold, sun nest syndrome, frog eye leaf spot, for example. However, we may not have scores for charcoal rot or Phomopsis, for example, that was mentioned previously. The other thing that's showing up to make sure to note is seed treatment. I think that's a thing that doesn't get asked. We need to make sure, does this have a levo or a saltro on it? Take note of that. Saltro is not no, labeled, not only for SDS and um, SEN, but also for red crown rock now. And a levo is being used in the West for it as well, and it covers SDS as well as SCN. The one thing I wanted to point out and I run into is with scores for, um, for stem canker. So sometimes it won't have a score for disease. The one thing to note is there's two, at least two, probably more different pathogens, different types of stem canker. When seed companies score those, they're scoring for southern stem canker. What if you have northern? So that complicates things. So back to these field visits. Here we are. So think they've already been sent off to a plant clinic. Those had fusarium, right? I did it myself. But I also took a soil probe out and I soil tested good areas and bad areas of both these fields. And what happened was A, I did not soil sample when it was dry just so you know, because you not, may not get good, good results. I waited till it had adequate moisture, but what I was finding is very low pH. And when I followed up with that farmer over there, he's like, well, I haven't limed in a while. And so this is something I was running into a lot in both corn and soy.
beginning fields. It's been here a while. It wasn't as bad this year, according to him. It looked really bad to me. Um, in this picture, you can see we, it's very, very deteriorated. It's very, very hard to diagnose at this time. You do see some of those fruiting structures there. Um, at this time, the other thing that Robert Bellin had told me is when you go look for red crown rot, not only are you going to find red crown rot, you're going to find every other disease there too, which makes it much more difficult. And that's what we found in Pike County. We were finding sun death syndrome, canker, stem canker, and we found red crown rot, which is, is probably the best uh, picture I have of those fruiting structures that really kind of scream to you, you have red crown rot. So at this time, Dr. Stephen Clow, who is the USDA um, ARS service, is trying to collect samples. Up until now, this is not an official map, but this is the map he has shared with me of the counties where we found red crown rot this year in the state. Uh, sorry for this busy poster. This is his poster that he shared. And basically, Uh, he's in It makes no sense. He's got some fence lines that he tore out. And he said it's almost like the pathogen, pathogen doesn't want to cross that fence line or where that vegetation grew. Just really strange things. And even plant, path, path, uh, plant pathologists that grow the fungus on a medium, it changes. They said it's the strangest organism fungus that they've ever dealt with before. It's just different. And so yield loss is going to depend on a lot of different factors, but it's going to be dependent upon the present, how long it's there, the disease triangle, of course, and drainage. Matt Montgomery reminded drainage. And my brother is putting tile in my field right now. Yes, drainage. It will be worse with water. Um, at this time, I'm not aware of any variety separation. It seems to, um, in fact, a lot of different soybeans. Um, soybean cyst nematode does make it worse. Soybean cyst nematode makes a lot of pathogens worse. Bronx dermot, sudden death syndrome, and so on. And crop rotation does help. Oops, almost missed you, Pam. So basically when it comes down to red crop management, you want the correct identification. We need some drainage. Um, there's been <laughs> speculation that maybe shorter season might help. I can't guarantee that. They're trying a lot of different things. Seed treatments. Dr. Carl Bradley is going to be coming to the Soybean Summit. You can share more results on that. They've kind of been mixed. Um, but for the, for the most part, that's all we have right now is seed treatments for this disease. Um, if you have it, sometimes we want to try to control soybean cyst nematode. Fungicides won't do anything. The main thing that we want answers to is that this pathogen could have a lot of alternate hosts, not just legumes. It could be woody type of things. The things we know now, peanut, alfalfa, papaya, koi, blueberries, indigo, um, and so on. And so stay tuned, we have a lot of work to do. And you may ask me a question and I may not know the answer. So with that, I'm just gonna conclude here is 
What did we learn this season? We learned we need to collect a lot of information. Don't just stop at uh, sending it off to the plant clinic. Do some more investigation. Test the good areas versus the bad areas. Um, take weather conditions into consideration. Uh, take note of the date that it showed up. It could be uh, abiotic environmental issue. It could be nutrient. Look at the field pattern. Don't just look at the leaf symptoms. You have to look at the roots. Rule out chemical issues. We had that too this year. It's okay to get a second opinion. That's fine. You can do it. There are differences between different soybean varieties. There are differences with seed treatments as well. And lastly, don't forget to soil test. Don't forget to apply lime. Pay attention to pH. And I'll leave it with, don't forget to test for SEN and more importantly, let's pay attention to sulfur as well. Right, Sean? We'll get there. Okay. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. Are there any questions? Have you noticed uh, tillage having less crown root worm? I mean, crown? Red crown root? Yeah. Is no-till fields worse than, than tillage fields? I don't think there's any difference that I know of. No. 